Distinguished guests, staff and students, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the University of Tasmania's 2014 International Women's Day Address. My name is Margaret Odlowski, I'm the Law Faculty Dean and I'm absolutely delighted to be in a position to welcome you all here and of course to importantly introduce our guest speaker, Eva Cox. By way of important preliminary matter, as a reflection of this institution's recognition of the deep um, history and culture of this island, the University of Tasmania wishes to acknowledge the Muhaniya people, the traditional owners and custodians of the land upon which this campus was built. I really want to thank you for all coming here this afternoon. It's really wonderful to see so many people and that we've needed to open up the, <laughs> the next layer. It's a tribute to you, Eva, to draw this crowd. Uh, just um, also to acknowledge um, not only the, the volume of people, but also the, the many women's groups represented, as you would have seen um, in the foyer. Um, another preliminary matter, just as a courtesy reminder to remember your mobile phones and perhaps turn them to silent. Uh, I know when the Vice-Chancellor is doing introductions, he always encourages people to tweet the event. And I know even Eva's a tweeter, so it's, it's all OK. So, so please feel free to do that. Today's event uh, acknowledges International Women's Day as you know. And Eva's provocative question, has progress stalled so we need to restart the feminist revolution, promises a great dissertation on feminism in Australia and what needs to be done to, so that the needs and interests of women are supported and to ensure that our state and nation benefit um, from their significant contributions. Of course, there have been different periods of feminism activity particularly notable the 1960s when Eva's um, work um, came to the fore across a broad range of uh, issues addressing um, questions of equality, um, sexual inequality, personal and political reproductive rights and other um, forms of, of discrimination and many achievements were gained. Uh, and of course the, the broader all-encompassing campaign that continues working towards gender, racial, economic and social justice. Reflecting on uh, achievements, undoubtedly there has been progress in terms of greater equality for women, if we think in terms of access of women to education, childcare, uh, the presence of anti-discrimination poli um, policies, also improvements towards pay equality. And certainly ranked internationally, Australia performs well in many of these domains. But we also know that many problems remain. We hear of um, lower pay um, of women, up to 17% less than men, uh, the small proportion of women who hold board seats in Australian companies, and that only a handful of the top um, CEOs um, in the top 200 companies are, are women. So something like five out of 200 are women. And this is particularly notable in the context of women's growing participation in tertiary education. So we know that that now, in fact, exceeds 50%, something like 60%, in fact, I think, are the statistics for this university. The problem is, however, that this is not being translated to substantial increases in the percentage of women in corporate leadership positions or other areas of leadership. So as thought leaders and educators, we must work to strengthen women's experience and opportunities for senior leadership positions. And I know there's been debate recently about the um, presence of women or, or numbers of women in politics, which is another area of leadership, um, obviously, of importance. If we can help to improve the gender balance in senior leadership roles, we can make a significant difference to Australia's ongoing business and economic health and future and maximise the potential of Australia's growing but currently underutilised pool of talented and high potential women. And a strong message that I know that Eva will be sharing with us tonight is that our economy, businesses and society more broadly would all benefit from more women in um, positions of leadership. Turning now to introduce our guest speaker, and of course her reputation precedes her, so you, you probably know much of this already, but clearly um, Eva comes to us as um, an influential Australian feminist who has devoted herself to improving the role for women in Australian society. She was born into a Jewish family during Hitler's annexation of Austria and the, as a family faced early difficulties um, having been declared stateless and um, fleeing to England and later Italy. She arrived in Australia at the age of 10 in 1948 
and I understand that she recalls early experiences, even as early as kindergarten, she may want to reflect on this herself um, with us, that stimulated her political activism and made her what is she, she has become, an irrepressible advocate for making societies fairer. fairer. Eva is an alumni of the University of New South Wales. That's where she took out um, her degree in sociology with honours. And she also worked as a researcher and tutor and took up the role of director of the New South Wales Council for Social Services before becoming advisor to the Federal Shadow Minister for Social Services, Senator Don Grimes. Eva is an unabashed feminist and passionately promotes inclusive, diverse and equitable ways of living together, drawing on her skills as sociologist, social commentator and social and political researcher. She's written widely on a range of political and social issues and her book, um, published in 1996, Leading Women, explained why women who make a difference were usually labelled as difficult, a label she readily, perhaps not happily, but readily wears. She was the ABC Boyer lecturer in 1995 and has been recognised for her um, advancement of women's welfare and other extensive contributions in a range of ways, um, namely through her appointment as Officer of the Order of Australia in 1995. She was named Humanist of the Year in 1997 and featured on a postage stamp as an Australian legend in 2011. And I just think that's wonderful to be a legend in one's own lifetime. Congratulations, Eva. <laughs> She's currently um, serving as Professorial Fellow at Jambana Indigenous House of Learning Research Centre at the University of Technology, um, Sydney. Now, Eva has kindly indicated that she'll be happy to take questions um, following her address. And my colleague, um, Dr. Christine Boerman, um, who's been instrumental, I must say, in organising Eva to be with us this evening, for which we're very grateful. And this is part of the Law Faculty Social Justice um, Lecture Series. We'll be facilitating the questions. Um, so that, that comes after Eva's presentation. So I'm delighted, as I said, to be here welcoming you all and particularly to welcome you, Eva. Uh, I thank you sincerely for accepting the invitation to um, present this address and I now call on you all to make Eva welcome as we call her to um, address us on this important topic. Thank you. Thank you. I always find it very difficult sitting there listening to somebody talking about me like that. I think, who's they talking about? That's not me. So here I am, an ageing feminist, left over from the 1970s women's movement, activist, I think, since the age of... What happened to me at the age of three, which was just briefly mentioned, was when I started at the local kindergarten in England during the war, they actually started handing out the instruments for the, uh, for the band and I had my eye on a drum and I was told, no, the boys got the drums and the cymbals, the girls got the triangle and the tambourine. It was a very unfortunate statement from some kindergarten teacher. It made me a lifetime feminist. <laughs> Who the hell wants a bloody tambourine and triangle when you could actually get a drum? I mean, really? <laughs> so nobody was going to tell me what I could or couldn't do because I was a girl, and that was something I got stuck with fairly solidly. But my other background as a Jewish refugee child was also sort of partly contributed to the fact that I grew up, and this is partly my father's fault, I'm a second generation world saver, uh, as he used to sort of address the issue of, you know, how do you, uh, you know, what have you done today to make the world a better place or to improve things? And I remember being grossly embarrassed as an adolescent by such questions, particularly in front of my friends. But it did give me the sense that we had an, I had an obligation, and I think we all have, so be careful after when you leave here, uh, to actually try and make the world a better place because I was intensely puzzled as a child as to what happened to Germany, what could happen to my parents, what could happen with the Holocaust, what could happen with all of the things that happened in those days. And one of my very firm convictions is that we don't want to see it happen again. And I must say, and I'm going to say that fairly clearly, that what is happening currently to people who are refugee, who are asylum seekers here has unfortunately some overtones of the same arguments. They've got money, they're queue jumpers, they're not people like us, and I think we ought to stop it. So being a feminist was a sort of passion about making change. 
And I've been involved, as I say, I got involved in the early 70s with the women's electoral lobby, which I'm unfortunately not a member of anymore, but that's another question story. But we did it because we wanted to make a lot of changes. And one of the things that we wanted to do, and I'm, there's a lot of grey hairs in this audience, is remind you that the women's movement in the 1970s called ourselves women's liberation or the women's movement. We avoided the word feminist. Jermaine actually agree, reminded me of it recently. We were both on at the Opera House. That we thought actually feminism was a bit poncy and incy and, you know, reformist and we wanted to actually change society. Now, one of the things that I want to remind all of you who can remember and, the, and actually tell the younger ones who can't was very different about the 60s and 70s was we all had a passion, those of us who were political activists, it wasn't all of us, had a passion to make changes. You had the, not only the women's movement, you also had sort of the black rights movement, the civil rights movements, the peace movement, uh, a multitude of other things, the beginning of gay rights, almost everything that you have now was started in the 70s, the 60s and 70s. We were optimistic and that's something we don't have anymore, about the fact that we could make changes, that we could fix the world, that there were things that we could do to make a better world for everybody. And that was despite the fact it was a fairly negative period in many ways with the Cold War and Club of Rome and potential atomic bombs and various other things that were happening at that time. And because we were optimists, we thought we could actually not only find out what was wrong, because we knew that, but we could offer the alternatives. Something happened. We, were good. we did a lot of stuff in the 70s, and you can see the remains of it sitting out there at the tables there. We started things. We actually created a whole lot of things, you know, looking at domestic violence, looking at women's health, looking at various other things. We removed all of the legal barriers, the formal legal barriers. Equal pay came in finally. The last bit came in in 1982, and we haven't shifted the gap since, but never mind. There's, that's a whole set of other issues. But if you take a look back, the bad news is that we really haven't progressed very much at all, I'd say, in the last 20 to 25 years and more, maybe. We did a lot of things in the 70s. We tidied them up in the 80s. We tidied them up further in the 90s. And we tidied a few extra bits up in the last decade. You can't blame it all on John Howard. It started long before he started. What you can blame it on, and I'm putting this up here to be thought about clearly, is something happened in the 80s, which changed the whole tone of debate in Western and de democratic, particularly Anglophone democracies. Anybody know what that was? Neoliberalism. Neo neo Not neo-capitalism, neoliberalism, which actually stuck the market into the equation. Suddenly, the whole debate about the role of the state shifted, basically because of the petrodollars and capitalism, uh, you know, sort of becoming global in the 1970s. Nobody wanted to support the idea of the nation state, and we thought nation states were there to make changes, like the whole post-war welfare stuff. So by the 1980s, we had had a shift from we to me, to summarise it up, about individualism about actually pushing the idea that what the whole system was about was individual success. Government was there to support the market. Government was there to pick up market failures only. The public sector was to be diminished and only there as a safety net. The whole idea of collective social change literally disappeared off the agenda. And the bloody stupid women's movement, including me, went along with it to some degree. We thought we could actually manage it. I have mea culpas on this because I remember sort of explaining to people why it was important to have childcare because it allowed women to have paid jobs. Now we only have childcare for two reasons. One is to get more women into the workforce and the other one is to make sure the little bastards get jobs when they're 18 because somebody in the USA showed if they had more childcare they'd have a better chance of getting jobs. Childcare has become a commercial service, not a community service. I don't know whether it's as bad as Tasmania as it is on the mainland, but it certainly is. We've lost the entire idea of collective sh risk sharing, of being part of a society, of being connected, of emotions, of relationships, of responsibility for others, 
of the whole social change type stuff that was very much part of the 1960s and 70s, when the good society, the big society, was part of the agenda. We replaced it with the fact that instead of living in a society, the assumption now is we live in an economy. The entire emphasis is on economic growth, on, you know, on despite the fact, you know, some of the environmental issues, on distrust and self-interest. You know, there's this bot I remember inventing in the 1980s called Erm, economically rational man, his initials. An economically rational man is at the basis of all of the equations that are used for the sort of neoliberal things. This is a self-interested individual who does things only, in a sense, to make their own benefits and profits. I worked out recently, the only thing that actually fits that stereotype is the corporation. Because human beings are not self-interested individuals. We are connected. We are part of society. We are interdependent. Relationships count. Feelings count. Ethics counts, when we remember that it's about what it's about. Yet all of that stuff disappeared off the agenda, and with it went most of what we wanted to do with the women's movement. I keep reminding people that there was a, a badge that was hanging around in the 1970s which said, any woman who wants to be equal to men has a low level of ambition. <laughs> all we talk about now in most of the women's movement is getting women to be the same as men. Get ourselves onto boards. Get ourselves into the top income brackets get ourselves some more superannuation, get ourselves to do that. It's individuated to the high degree, and most women have gone along with it. We have not seriously challenged it. We've used the language of economics to justify what we do to the point where I was listening on International Women's Day, the radio in Sydney, when somebody talking about violence against women was saying, but it's very important that we stop the violence against women. I mean, every woman that we can stop the violence against, we save $400,000 for the government. And I thought, fuck me dead, that's where we've ended up. <laughs> never mind concepts of justice, never mind concepts of uh, fairness, never mind any of that, let's just save money. So, I want to sort of go back to the idea that we had in the 70s, which was to create social change and have some deep discussions. I went back and started reading some of the stuff we'd written then about how we change society to put those areas of society which weren't about war, death, trade, you know, sort of greed, self, things like that, how we actually at least moved some of that public sphere away and over, so the private stuff, which was about relationships, care, people, etc., etc., which is the feminised area, how we put that on the agenda. We did manage to put domestic violence on the agenda and rape laws and the various other things, and we fixed those to some degree, but we did not fix the data. There's still as much violence against women now as there was when we started. What we did was classic feminine crap, we set up the services to rescue the people. We did not fix the problem. We run the services. We do a bloody good job in making sure that we run the services. I'm not dumping on it. But we have not really been able to work out how to stop the violence. And one of the reasons I think is, and it comes through very clearly in Sydney at the moment, is if men are going to be violent to each other, they're also going to be violent to women. So why aren't we having campaigns to stop violence? to stop that excessive masculinity that sort of gets expressed with bashing the shit out of somebody when you go out and have a few drinks. Not just saying, stop hitting women, but it's all right to go out and hit your mates, because it just doesn't work. So I think we've got to, in a sense, stop talking about women's issues, because every time we mention women's issues, we devalue it. You know, we can't run an article, says the journal, on childcare this week because we did domestic violence last week and that's enough women's issues for this month. Thank you. We can't do, you know, we've got to start talking about how we create a good society. And this means that we actually have to work with men who also are not happy about the sorts of society they're living in. But we need leadership from women because most men will not stir it up against the mainstream considerations that they have to do it. Take a look at workplaces. This is an example I keep using. Those of you who are old enough to remember might remember. Remember the days when we actually had a whole set of conversations going about shortening working weeks? 
we went from 40 weeks to 38 hours, and then we went from 38 hours to 37 and a half hours, and then we went to 35 in some areas, and then the conversation stopped. We haven't talked about it. And what's more, working hours went up in the 80s and 90s. They tapered off at the end of the 90s. We now have some of the longest working weeks, working days and working weeks anywhere. And interestingly enough, if you're actually looking at workplace competence, the country in Europe that has the highest productivity per hour is the one that has the shortest working week, which happens to be Holland. Do we ever mention it? No, because we actually have a macho workplace culture which assumes that if you're a serious worker, you stay at work and you are not distracted by having children. So anybody who wants flexible working hours or part-time working hours, male or female, interestingly enough, is regarded as not a serious worker. And that's got worse over the last 30 years rather than better. Yes, we've got more women with part-time jobs, but that's partly because part-time now is almost the same as full-time would have been when we thought we were going to cut back on working hours. So I want to debate about working hours, shortening working hours, so that we can all be civilised, so that men can pick up more of the unpaid work, so that we can actually seriously redistribute work around. It's not even on the agenda. I don't know any woman's group that's actually talking about it. What we're doing is protesting against possible cuts. We're protesting against things going wrong. There is very little serious policy work being done anywhere in the women's movement at the moment. I keep trying to do it. You know, the old groups that were doing it, they're writing protests and they're filling in sort of things about inquiries, as I did, you know, for the things there. But we're not actually sitting down saying, what's the ideal society we'd like to live in? But I still believe that unless women feminists, and I will make a distinction there, get into sort of trying to work out some utopian vision, some sort of light on the hills, some sort of feminist version of the society we want to live in, and enlist the men that want also to get themselves out of the current particularly nasty way that things are happening, that we can actually try and organise change. But unless some optimism and some ideas come out, we can't be. Now, people say, oh, you're being much too negative. I'm getting this feedback. I mean, there's all these really interesting things that are happening. Where? What? Yes, we're jumping up and down about running the services. Yes, women are fulfilling the role that we've always fulfilled of, of raising lots of money for good causes. You know, we run lots of services, and I'm not being nasty about the fact we need those services. But politically, in the big picture type stuff, there's not very much happening. Now, as evidence, I've sort of grabbed a couple of things. This is my, these are my Boyer lectures, which I said in almost 20 years ago now, 1995, a truly civil society, that we needed to actually move back into the social. We needed to think about social capital rather than financial capital as what made the society work. I also bought a copy of, brought a copy of something else that was written around that time, which was the Refractory Girl collection, which I've got some of the remaining copies of, if anybody here remembers Refractory Girl. It was a very significant journal which had a strong Tasmanian component uh, that actually was, that was our 20th anniversary in 1993, so 20 years ago last year. Everything we said should happen is still in the should basket. We haven't moved very far at all in the last 20 years. The last thing I brought down was a collection which I've got something in called Bewitched and Bedeviled, Women Write the Gillard Years, because the issue of what happened to Julia Gillard has stimulated us to think seriously about some of the basic sexism that's still embedded in Australian society. I think we can use some of what's happened over the last few years, not only to Gillard, to your current Premier, to other women. I mean, take a think about it. Oh, we keep cracking the glass ceiling. We don't. We scratch it. We had one woman premier in Western Australia, one woman premier in, in Tasmania. Now, I don't think we'll have another one for a while. People don't think we will. You know, one in New South Wales, one in Victoria, one in Tasmania. The AC, uh, not Tasmania, in Queensland, though even she was actually elected. She was the only one that was actually elected. The ACT's actually had two one Liberal and one Labour, which is interesting, but that's the only one. So we're not changing things. I think we've got to give up assuming that getting women onto boards or more women into top positions is actually going to change anything. 
The only women that they're going to let into those systems are the ones that aren't going to change it. Nobody's ever going to appoint me to a board. I'm a troublemaker. <laughs> you know, as the intro said, change comes from being difficult women. I remember giving a lecture to a whole lot of uh, uh, headmistresses from girls' private sc uh, schools. And they said, oh, yes, we're training all of these women for leadership. You know, they're being head girls and this and that and the prefects and others. I said, what are you doing about your bad girls? And they said, what do you mean? <laughs> I said, unless you train your bad girls for leadership, we're not going to get anywhere because good girls are not going to make lousy leaders. <laughs> and I'm going to say something here which will probably make me somewhat unpopular here. Was Julia Gillard was a good girl. She did what she was supposed to do. She did what her faction asked of her. She actually was quite conservative on a lot of things. She was a bloody good manager. I don't think in many ways she was a terrific prime minister. Her policies, including the stuff that she did to single parents and some of the other social stuff that came out of that Labour government was not good. And I don't think she even noticed because her entire version of what, happened, what you did if you wanted to change things was get a job. Now, now one of the things is jobs are fine, paid jobs are fine. I've always said we actually need paid work. But we also need to recognise that society runs on a hell of a lot of unpaid work. And if you're a single parent, you've got a part-time job at best, sometimes it's more than that. To assume that you would go, that if they starve you, that you will then go and get some more work is, as far as I'm concerned, unforgivable. And that's one of the things that I think we need to think about that's happened over the last few years. They finally admitted, the Labour Party, Bill Shorten admitted he got it wrong after they couldn't change it. But we, incidentally, she made that, that particular legislation also went through on the day she made the misogyny speech, which I think is something that we just need to notice. I think we need to not expect, and I'm following it deliberately by using the Gillard example, that just because we get women into top positions, they're going to change things. They wouldn't let them get there if they were going to change things. Even having 50% of women, they might change things in some minor ways, but it will be fairly minor. We need to keep the pressure on from the outside. We need to actually do make the pushing. We don't need to blindly assume that what if we get more women there, more women break the glass ceiling, that they'll actually change the bloody floor plan. Why would they? They've succeeded in the current system. I'm a sociologist and I keep saying the trouble with a lot of people is they read Karl Marx if you happen to be a lefty, but they didn't read Max Weber. Anybody here who's, I can hear a few giggles. Max Weber in the 19, early, late 18th century, no, beginning of the 19th century, wrote very clearly that institutions have an infinite capacity to protect themselves against change. And that's something we did not know about in the 70s. We assumed, we ran equal opportunities, not just to get more women into top positions because we thought it would change things. And it took one of my bosses some years later to say to me when I was complaining about some woman who'd done the wrong thing in a senior position, you must recognise that having equality for women means you'll get as many female fuckwits in top positions as male fuckwits. <laughs> and if you look around, you can see it. So if we want equality for women, we have to assume that the dumb and the not so well meaning and the other things will be there just the same as we've got an awful lot of dumb blokes in the top positions as well. But to go back to where I sort of started from, which is to try and say, what do we do about it? I think it's really important to get back to some of the sorts of basics of what we were trying to do in the 70s and recast it for the, you know, for the years 2020 plus. It's a very different world that we're living in now in many, many ways. Technology has changed things. Why do we have presentism at work? Why do you have to be there? They can get you on your iPhone, you know, in five minutes flat. That might not be ideal, but if you've got a sick kid, it makes it a lot better than trying to sort of find somebody else to go to work. The idea of people having to be present, the idea that jobs have to be sort of done within the sorts of structures that they've been in the past. We need to take a good long look at that. We need to take a good long look at productivity. We need to promote the idea that maybe we all have part-time jobs and it's going to be over the dead bodies of a lot of union people. One of the reasons that we don't move on with the shorter working hours stuff is the unions don't like it. And what's more, if men had to go home, they might actually have to do the housework and deal with the arsenic hour. 
Now, there are men that want to do that. There's some, hopefully, in the audience tonight that don't want to be the hard 10-hour-a-day breadwinner being pushed with all of those things there. But they can't do that now because they lose their place in the queue if they sort of sell out by looking as though they're a wuss. We need to start changing the gender assumptions seriously in ways that actually make it much more possible for us to change things. I mean, there was something I read today in the paper about a survey which women and men were asked, they were given two candidates for a job and asked to, which one they thought was more suitable for a job which had a high amount of mathematics in it. Men and women picked the bloke on their picture alone. So, you know, we need to make sure that we clean up what's in our heads as well. I think part of it is the women themselves don't stick their necks out. We're not very good risk takers, I am. Don't know why, I think maybe it's my ethnic background, whatever you want to do it on. But women don't like speaking up. They don't like getting up. They don't like saying things. Not all of us, but far too many of us. I used to very often walk out of conferences having got myself into debates to have people come up to me in the toilet and say, I really agreed with what you said in there, thank you. I said, why didn't you get up and say it in there? Because I'm not like you, they'd say almost proudly. And I felt like swearing at them and sometimes did. <laughs> Women think that, you know, they can't say anything unless they know everything about it. Well, I discovered many years ago, particularly the conference on women's superannuation, which I didn't know a lot about, but I did know something about when I was introduced as this is Australia's expert on women and superannuation. <laughs> and I thought, I can't even remember the difference between vesting and whatever that other stuff is. <laughs> but I do understand it. But what I worked out is most of the blokes there that came from the superannuation industry knew even less than I did about the issue. So we can do it. We can fly. We can actually talk about things without having a PhD in it. We can apply for jobs even if we don't think we've got all the qualifications. Why do men apply for jobs when they've got 30 to 40 percent of the qualifications and women when they've got 110 percent and then they're devastated because it was the job they really wanted and now they didn't get it so they assume that it was their fault. We've got to do quite a lot of work on how we get women to do things. And that's not only my generation or even the two generations after it. I was involved in Sydney with a group called the F Collective and we were trying to talk about who was going to talk on International Women's Day. So they said to me, was I happy to talk? And I said, sure. And then they said, okay, we need one of the younger women talking as well. And they spent something like 20 minutes with everybody going around the table saying, oh, I couldn't possibly do it. And then we had a similar conversation at some stage when I suggested somebody talked about sole parents. Oh, I'm not a sole parent, I couldn't do it. We'll stand up and say, why are you, as a non-sole parent, to do it? No, I can't do that, I don't know enough. Sorry, if you're going to wait until you know enough, we're going to lose the revolution. We've just lost it in the last 30 years. So can people get off their bums and talk about things they don't know about, learn how to study it and work it out? Even works on the media, I can tell you. I've been doing it for the last 30 years. You can be a very quick learner. But we need to do it. Women need to get off their bums and do things. And what we need to do now, over the next few years, is try and rescue this unholy mess that men have made of the world in the last 20 to 30 years. This goes back to Paul Keating, who thought the economy really was a machine that used, and he used to stand there, you can go and find him in his speeches saying, when you get the settings right, he'd say, twiddling his hands, you know, you just have to get the settings right. You know, he's a, he was a tradie to start off with, an electrician, and he sort of still thought it all worked like that. Then the world will work properly. And he brought in a lot of the neoliberal stuff that Howard continued. I was really, I started some of what I'm saying now last year when I was actually asked to write something about uh, Maggie Thatcher when she died. And I started hunting through the, uh, you know, the quotes and things. And one of her quotes when asked what her great successes were one of her quotes was Tony Blair, and they said, why? She said, because he didn't change anything I put there. And I thought you could actually probably use that same description for, unfortunately, um, Keating in his prime ministership. He pushed an awful lot of neoliberal stuff. He had some other good points, but he pushed that stuff. So Howard picked it up and ran neoconservatism over the top of it. And then we got a change of government and we got the, the GFC, which was done by an excess of masculinity, I'm quite sure. All of the stuff that if you look at it, you know, they, that exuberance, what do they call it? There's some term the economists use about, you know, the over-exuberance. 
you know, was a very good example of too much sort of male hormones sort of charging away. It was completely irrational, and yet somehow or other it sort of has staggered on. But the whole market model is beginning to fall apart. People have realised that economics, there's a, a group of French feminist economists who call it an autistic science. Now, the disability people always have a go at me when I mention that, but it's not a bad description of, of the content of economics because it can't deal with emotions, relationships, values and lots of things of that sort. So we've got to say economics should be moved down so it's what pays for what we have. But we've got to move out of the assumption that it should be running the country and that we should be taking it on. Let's put the other social sciences, which at least as accurate as economics is about predicting the future, that were fashionable, like sociology and politics and psychology. Let's put them back on the agenda. And let's use our feminist understanding of what really matters about who we are and what society we want to belong to to start rewriting the script so that us older ones and the younger ones can get together and say this is the society we want to live in and provide some leadership from the feminism, not just women, and let's fix it all up. So that's the challenge I'm leaving for you. That's why we have International Women's Day because as Liz Broderick says, if we don't mention women, if we do mention women, we get some attention. If we don't mention women unintentionally, they will ignore us. And I think it's time we stopped having one day of the year and claimed the other 364 at least. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. I think we've had an incredibly thought-provoking debate. I'd also like to thank the men for coming. It's always good that it's not just here or us alone. How I'd... often do they clap when we turn up at their stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to thank the women's organisations who had tables in the foyer. They do an amazing job. And if you want further information about what these organisations are doing in, the commu in the, our community, please stop and have a look at the information there. I'd also like to promote the Vagina Monologues, 12th of April being put on by <laughs> the, <laughs> um, the women's uh, um, shelter. Um, it'll be a great night. Thirdly, I'd like to thank the Dean of the Law School for enabling us to hold events as thought-provoking as this. We've had a real push um, into the social justice sphere and it's because of your support. So I'd like to thank Marg for that. And finally, and I don't think I need to say any more, I'd like to thank Eva for being a bad girl. <laughs>